The Thief by Megan Wallen Turner. Chapter one. I didn't know how long I had been in the king's prison. The days were all the same, except that each one passed, I was dirtier than before. Every morning, the light in the cell changed from the wavering orange of the lamp in the sconce outside my door to the dim but even glow of the sun falling into the prison's central courtyard. In the evening, as the sunlight faded, I reassured myself that I was only one day closer to getting out. To pass time, I concentrated on pleasant memories, laying them out in order and examining them carefully. I reviewed over and over the plans that had seemed so straightforward before I arrived in jail. And I swore to myself and every God I knew that if I got out alive, I would never, never, never take any risk that were so amiserably stupid again. I was thinner than I had been when I first was arrested. The large iron ring around my waist had grown loose, but not loose enough to fit over the bones of my hips. Few prisoners were chained in their cells, only those that the king particularly disliked, counts or dukes, or the minister of the esquire when he told the king there wasn't any more money to spend. I was certainly none of those things, but I suppose it's safe to say that the king disliked me even if he didn't remember my name or whether I was as common as dirt. He didn't want me slipping away. So I had chains on my ankles as well as the iron belt around my waist and an entirely useless set of chains locked around my wrist. At first I pulled the cuffs off my wrist, but since I sometimes had to force them back on quickly, my wrist started to be rubbed raw. After a while, it was less painful just to leave the manacles on to take my mind off my daydreams, I pra practiced moving around the cell without clanking. I had enough chain allowed to me to pace in an arc from a front corner of the cell to the center of the room and back to the rear corner. My bed was there at the back, a bench made of stone with a thin bag of saw sawdust on top. Beside it was the chamber pot. There was nothing else in the cell except my fel myself and the chain, and twice a day, food. The cell door was a gate of bars. The guards looked in at me as I passed on their rounds, a tribute to my reputation. As part of my plans for greatness, I had bragged without shame about my skills in every wine store in the city. I had wanted everyone to know that I was the finest thief since mortal men were made and I must have come close to accomplishing the goal. Huge crowds had gathered for my trial. Most of the guards in the prison had turned out to see me after my arrest, and I was endlessly chained to my bed when other prisoners were sometimes allowed the freedom and sunshine of the prison's courtyard. There was one guard who always seemed to chase me with my head in my hands, and he always laughed. What, he would say, haven't you escaped yet? Every time he laughed, I spat insults at him. It was not polite, but as always, I couldn't keep an insult in when it wanted to come out. Whatever I said, the guard just laughed more. I ached with cold. It had been early in the spring when I'd been arrested and dragged out of the shade oak wine shop. Outside the prison walls, the summer's heat must have dried out the city and driven everyone indoors for afternoon naps but the prison cells got in no direct sunlight and they were as damp and cold as when I first arrived. I spent hours dreaming of the sunshine, the way it soaked into the city walls and made the yellow stones hot to lean on hours after the day had ended, the way it dried out water spills and the rare libations to the gods still occasionally poured into the dust outside the wine shops. Sometimes I moved as far as my chains would let me, and looked through the bars of my cell door and across the deep gallery that should shaded the prison cells at the sunlight falling into the courtyard. The prison was two stories of cells stacked on top of one another. I was in the upper level. Each cell opened into the gallery and their gallery was separated from the courtyard by stone pillars. 
There were no windows in the outside walls, which were three or four feet thick, built of massive stones that ten men together couldn't have shifted. Legend said that the old gods had stacked them together in a day. The prison was visible from almost anywhere in the city because the city was built on a hill and the prison was at the summit. The only other building there was, there was the king's home, his Megron. There had also been a temple to the old gods once, but it had been destroyed. And the basilic to the gods was built further down the hill. Once the king's home had been a true Megaron, one room with a throne and a hearth, and the prison had been the Aragon, where citizens met and merchants hopped their jumble. The individual cells had been stalls of clothes or wine or candles or jewelry imported from the islands. Prominent citizens used to stand on the stone blocks in the courtyard and make speeches. Then the invaders had come with their long boats and their own ideas of commerce. They did their trading in open markets next to their ships. They had taken over the King's Megaron for their governor and used the solid stone building of the Aragon as a prison. Prominent citizens ended up chained to the blocks instead of standing on them. The old invaders were pushed out by new invaders, and in some time, Soris revolted and had her own king again. Still, people did their trading down by the waterfront. It had become habit, and the new king continued to use the Aragon as a prison. It was useful to him, as he was no as he was no relation to any of the families that had ruled the city in the past. By the time I ended up there, most people in the city had forgotten the prison was ever anything but a holding pen for those who failed to pay their taxes and other criminals. I was lying on my back in my cell with my feet in the air, wrapped in the chain that led from my wrist, waist to a ring high on the wall. It was late at night. The sun had been gone for hours and the prison was lit by burning lamps. I was weighing the merit of clean clothes versus better food and not paying attention to the trample of feet outside my cell. There was an iron door that led from the prison into a guard room at the narrow end of the building. The guards passed through it many times a day. If I heard the door banging, I no longer took any notice of it. So I was unprepared when the lamplight concent concentrated by a lens flared into my cell. I wanted to look lithe and graceful and perhaps feral as I unwrapped my feet and sat up. Caught by surprise and nearly blind, I was clumsy and would have fallen off the stone bunk if the chain had not still been wrapped around one foot. This is the right one. No wonder the voice sounded surprised. I levered myself upright and blinked into the lamp lot, unable to see much. The guard reassured someone that this indeed was the prisoner he wanted. All right, take him out. The guard said, yes, Mangus. As he unlocked the barred gate, so I knew who it was at my door late at night. One of the king's most powerful advisors. In the day before the invaders came, the king's Magnus was supposed to have been a sorcerer, but not even the most superstitious believe that anymore. Mangus was... A scholar, he read scrolls and books in every language and studied everything that had ever been written and things that had never been written as well. If the king needed to know how many shafts of grain grew on a particular acre of land, the Mangus could tell him. If the king wanted to know how many farmers would starve if he burned that acre of grain, the Mangus knew that too. His knowledge matched by his skill of persuasion gave him the power to influence the king. And that made him a powerful figure at the court. He'd been at my trial. I'd seen him sitting in the gallery behind the judges with one leg crossed over the other and his arms folded over his chest. Once I had disentangled myself from the chains, the guards unlocked the rings on my feet, using a key as big as my thumb. They left the manacles on my wrist, but released the chain that attached them to the, to the waist ring. They then hauled me to my feet and out of the cell. The Mangus looked me up and down and wrinkled his nose, probably at the smell. He wanted to know my name. 
I said, Gene. He wasn't interested in the rest. Bring him along, he said, as he turned his back on me and walked away. All on my own impulses and to balance and move seemed to conflict with those of the guards, and I was jerked and jostled down the portion, just as graceful as a sick cat. We crossed through the guard room to a door that led through the outer wall of the prison to a flight of stone steps and a courtyard that lay between the prison and the south wing of the king's megron. The megron's walls rose four stories over our heads on three sides. The king's tiny stronghold had become a pl palace under the supervision of the invaders, an even larger palace since then. We crossed the courtyard, following a guard carrying a lantern, to a shorter flight of steps that led up to a door in the wall of the Megaron. On the other side of the door, the white walls of the passageway reflected the light of so many lamps that it seemed as bright as day inside. I threw my head sideways and dragged one arm away from the guard in order to cover my eyes. The light felt solid like spears that went through my head. Both guards stopped and the one tried to grab my arm back, but I dragged it away again. Mangus stopped to see what the noise was. Give him a moment to let his eyes adjust, he said. It was going to take longer, but the minute helped. I blinked some of the tears out of my eyes and we started down the passageway again. I kept my head down and my eyes nearly closed and didn't see much of the passageway at first. They had marble floors. The baseboards were painted with the occasional patch of lilies and a tortoise or a resting bird. We went up a staircase where a painted pack of hunting dogs chased a lion around a corner to a door where we stopped. The Magnus stopped, knocked, and went in. The guards, with some difficulty, navigating themselves and me through the narrow doorway. I looked around to see who had watched my clumsy entrance, but the room was empty. I was excited. My blood rushed around like wine sloshing in a jar. But I also, but I was also deadly tired. The walk up the stairs had felt like a hike up a mountain. My knees wobbled, and I was glad to have the guards, gracelessly as they were, holding me at the elbows. When they let go, I was off balance and I had to swing my arms to keep from falling. My chains clanked. You can go, the Magnus said to the guards. Come take him back in half an hour. Half an hour? My hopes, which had been rising, fell a little. As the guards left, I looked around the room. It was small, with a desk and several comfortable chairs scattered around it. The Magnus stood next to the desk. The windows behind him should have looked out on the Megaron's greater courtyard, but the tiny panes of glass only reflected the light of the lamps burning inside. I looked again at the chairs. I picked the nicest one and sat in it. The Magnus stiffened. His eyebrows snapped down to a single line across the top of his face. They were dark, though most of his hair had gone to gray. Get up, he commanded. I leaned further into the fellow pill pillows on the seat and back of the chair. It was almost as good as clean clothes. I couldn't have gotten up if I'd tried. My knees were weak and my stomach was considering tossing up the little bit that I had recently eaten. The chair back came to just behind my ears. So I rested my head back and looked up my nose at the Magnus, still standing by his desk. The Magnus gave me a few moments to consider my position before he stepped over to the chair. He leaned down until his nose was just a few inches from mine. I hadn't seen his face before from this close. He had a high bridge nose of most people of the city, but his eyes were very light gray instead of brown. His forehead was covered by wrinkles and brought on by a lot of sun and too much frowning. I was thinking that he must have done some sort of outdoor work before he started reading books when he spoke. I stopped thinking about his complexion and shifted my gaze back to his eyes. You might someday attain a relationship of mutual respect, he said softly. First, I thought, I will see gods walking the earth, he went on. For now, I will have your obedience. His ability to convey a world of threat in so few words was remarkable. I swallowed, and my hand shook a little where they lay on the arms of the chairs. One link of the chain clinked against another, 
but I still didn't try to get up. My legs wouldn't have lifted me. He must have realized this and known also that he had made his point because he stepped back to lean against the desk and waved one hand in disgust. Never mind. Stay there for now. The seat will have to be cleaned. I felt my face getting redder. It wasn't my fault that I stank. He should spend some months in the king's prison, and then we'd see if he still smelled like old books and scented soap. He looked over me for several moments more and didn't seem impressed. I saw you at your trial, he said finally. I didn't say that I noticed him there as well. You're thinner. I shrugged. Tell me, said the Magus, have you found yourself reluctant to relieve our hospitality? You said at your trial that not even the king's prison could hold you, and I rather expected you to be gone by now. He was enjoying himself. I crossed my legs and settled deeper into the chair. He winced. I said, some things take time. How true, said Magnus. How much time do you think it's going to take? Another half hour, I thought, but I didn't say that either. I think it's going to take a long time, said the Magnus. I think it could take the rest of your life. <laughs> After all, he joked, when you're dead, you certainly won't be in the king's prison, will you? I suppose not. I didn't think he was very funny. You boasted about a lot of things at your trial. Idle boast, I suppose. I can steal anything. So you claimed. It was a wager to that effect that landed you in prison. He picked a pin nip off the desk beside him and turned it in his hands for a moment. It is too bad for you that intelligence does not always attend gifts such as yours. And fortunate for me, that is not your intelligence I'm interested in, but your skill. If you're as good as you say you are, I repeated myself, I can steal anything. Accept yourself out of the king's prison, the Magnus asked, lifting one eyebrow this time. I shrugged. I could do that too, but it would take time. It might take a long time, and I wanted the king's Magnus to offer a faster way. Well, you've learned how to keep your mouth shut at least, said the Magnus. He pulled himself away from his desk and walked across the room. While his back was turned, I pushed the hair away from my eyes and took another quick look around the room. It was his study, but I already knew that. There were books and old scrolls and piles on the shelves. There was a scratched bench piled with amphorias and other clay containers. There were glass bottles as well. At the end of the room was a curtain to clove, and barely visible under the curtain was a pair of feet in leather boots. I turned back around in my chair with my stomach jumping. You could shorten the time without shortening your life, said the Magnus. I looked up at him. I'd lost the thread of conversation. In the moment it took me to recover it, I realized that he was now nervous himself. I relaxed in my seat. Go on. I want you to steal something. I smiled. Do you want the king's seal? I can get it for you. If I were you, said the Magnus, I'd stop bragging about that. His voice grated. My smile grew. The gold ring with the engraved ruby had been his keepsake when I had stolen it away. Losing it, I was sure, had badly damaged his standing at the king's court. He glanced over my shoulder at the curtain to clove, and then he got to the point. There's something I want you to steal. Do this for me, and I'll see that you go... Don't go back to the prison. Fail to do this for me, and I will still make sure that you don't go back to the prison. The prisoners left the king's position, prison all the time. Masons, carpenters, blacksmiths, any skilled craftsman could, ex could expect to finish their sentence working for the king's profit. Unskilled workers were collected several times a year and sent to the silver mines south of the city. They rarely returned. And other prisoners just disappeared. It was clear enough what the Magnus had in mind, so I nodded. What am I stealing? That was all I cared about. The Magnus dismissed the question. You can find out the details later. What I need to know now is that you're capable. 
that I hadn't been overcome by disease, crippled or starved beyond usefulness while in prison. I'm capable, I said, but I have to know what I'm stealing. You'll be told. For now, it isn't your business. What if I can't steal it? I thought you could steal anything, he taunted. Accept myself out of the king's prison, I agreed. Don't try to be smart, the Magnus shook his head. You don't pretend very well. I opened my mouth to say something I shouldn't have, but he went on. It will require some traveling to reach my object. There will be plenty of time for you to learn about it as we go. I sat back in my chair, mollified and delighted. If I got out of the city of Surus, no one would bring me back. The Magnus would have had to have known exactly what I was thinking because he leaned close over me again. Don't think I'm a fool. He wasn't a fool. That much was true. But it didn't have my motivation. He leaned back against the desk and I sat back in my chair, thinking that the gods had listened to my prayers at last. Then I heard the ring on the top of the curtain behind me slide across the rod, and I remembered the two feet in the clove. My stomach, which had been settled a little, began to jump. The boots stomped across the room, and a hand came over the back of the chair in order to grab me by the hair. The owner of the hand lifted me up as he walked to the front of the chair and held me facing him. Don't think I'm a fool either, he said. He was short, just as his father had been, and stocky. His hair was dark gold color and curled around his ears. It would have looked infeminate than on anyone else. It probably endeared him to his mother when he was a child. But there was nothing endearing about him now. My hair was pulling free from my head, and I was standing on the tips of my toes to relieve the strain. I put both hands on top of his, tried to pull, push the hand down, and found myself hanging entirely off the ground. He dropped me, my legs folded under me, and I sat on the floor with a thump that jarred my entire body. I rubbed my head, trying to push, push the hair back into my scalp. When I looked up, the king was wiping his hand on the front of his clothes. Get up, he said. I did, still rubbing my head. The king of sufferance was not polished, nor was he an impressive bear-like man, the way kings were in my mother's fairy tales. He was too short and too oily, and he was a shade too fat to be elegant. But he was shrewd. He routinely doubled his taxes and kept a large army to prevent any rebellions by his citizens. The taxes supported the army, and when the army itself became a threat, he sent it off to fight with his neighbors. The victories enriched the treasury. The kingdom of Cyrus was bigger than it had been any time since the invaders had broken off pieces of it and awarded it to the allies. The king had driven the Antilonians out of their land on the Cyrus side of the Hempestol Mountains, forcing them back through the narrow pass through the country of Edis to the Antilonians' homeland on the far side. There were rumors that he wanted to annex land there as well, and that Antilon was preparing for all-out war. Ignoring his magnus, Soros walked over to the bench on the wall beside my chair. He pulled a small casket off it and carried it to the magnus's desk, where he tipped out its contents. A cascade of double heavy gold coins. A single one would buy a family's farm and all of its livestock. Several pieces fell and rang on the stone floor. One landed by my foot and lay staring up at me like a yellow eye. I almost bent to pick it up, but stopped myself and said it, and said instead, my uncle used to keep that much under his bed and count it every night. Liar, said the king. You've never seen that much gold before in your life. He couldn't know that I'd overstayed my welcome one night while creep, creeping through his megaron and crawled up through the space where the pipes of the hippocost ran to hide his treasure room. I had slept for a day in a stuffy darkness on a rigid tops of his treasure trunks. Cyrus tra tapped the chest, lying empty on its side in front of him. This is the gold that I'm off going to offer as a reward if you fail to bring back what I'm sending you for. I'll offer it to anyone from this country or any other who brings you to me. He took the casket upright and snapped the lid down. 
I felt my stomach dropping. It would be hard to outrun a reward like that. I'd be hunted from one end of the world to the other. I'd want you alive, of course, said the king, and carefully described the grisly things that would happen to me when I was captured. I tried to stop listening after a few examples, but he went on and on, and I was mesmerized like a bird in front of a snake. Magnus stood with his hands crossed across his chest and listened just as carefully. He didn't seem nervous anymore. He must have been satisfied that the king had accepted his plan and that his threats would encourage me in my work. My stomach felt worse and worse. My cell, when I was returned to it, felt warm and safe by comparison to the Magnus' study. As soon as the guards were gone, I lay down on my stone bench and dumped the king and his threats out of my head without ceremony. They were too unpleasant to worry over anyways. I concentrated on a vision of myself, leaving the prison. I made myself as comfortable as possible and went to sleep.